Hi, thanks for listening to today's message from Calvary Baptist Church in Lake Havasu City, Arizona. We are in a series of messages based on Paul's letter to the Galatians. Today, we are focused on living authentically and overcoming hypocrisy. To follow along with the Life Notes, download them now from calvaryaz.com forward slash Life Notes. Now, here is Pastor Robert Smith. Go ahead and have a seat. It's good to be with you this morning. My name is Robert. I'm one of the the pastors here. And uh, you can go ahead and open your Bibles to Galatians chapter 2. Galatians 2 is where we're going to be at today. We've been going through the book of Galatians for a little bit now, looking at uh, just how we understand the life that God has for us, what it means to live a life in Christ and experience the fruit, the good uh, results of what he has for us as we do so. And uh, today we're going to be looking uh, at the, the topic of authenticity. How do we authentically live out our faith? And, and as we look at Galatians 2 today, I believe we're going to see that if we want to live for Jesus, it requires living like Jesus at all times. And, and this is because we live in a world that, that values and desires authenticity and truth. And, and I think more than that, it expects it. And, and I was thinking about some different ways that we expect this, even in, in places that maybe we would, we would live a little bit more cynically in thinking about product advertising and marketing. We kind of assume that they're trying to lie to us, and yet we expect there to be some truth in that. And, and there's even laws around that because there are laws stating that advertising has to be true and accurate accurately depict what is being advertised. That is, at least if it's a U.S.-based company, if you're ordering from Wish.com or Timu or something like that, all bets are off. Um, but, but we expect that. We expect that the money that we use to buy products is real and genuine, and we have mechanisms in place to, to verify that. But also, we just genuinely trust that that is the case, unless we have reason to believe otherwise. We have things in place to verify authenticity of the, the items we buy, whether it's you know, a, a smaller item like you know, a watch or a purse or sunglasses. We know how to tell a, a fake from something real or even the bigger items. When we're buying a used car, we have Carfax to help us verify that the story that the seller is giving us is true and authentic and it genuinely represents it. But even more than that, with people, we desire and expect people to be real and authentic with us which is why it gets so frustrating to us when people prove to be fake, when people are inconsistent, when people let us down, when people prove to be two faces or whatever negative phrase that we use to describe their inconsistent behavior. So in a world that not only values and desires authenticity and truth, but expects it, is it any wonder that the thing that keeps the unchurched from being interested in the message of Jesus is inconsistent living among his followers? And see, it's so interesting because we have the greatest news that could ever be told. The fact that God himself sent his son to save us and reconcile us to himself, that that we have hope in, in grace available in Christ. Why aren't more people interested in that? And for the last 10 or 15 years or so, as I've been in ministry, I've always loved gathering more information. I'm a, I'm a data person. Uh, if you're not, sorry, stick with me for a second. But, but every year there's this group called Barna and they do these massive research studies and they, they want to learn more about our world because, and I love this because I think if we better understand them, we can better communicate the message of the gospel to them. And, and one of the, the top questions they always ask is if, hey, if you don't believe in Jesus, you're not involved in church, why? Which is a great, ant- uh, a great question to ask because again, we believe that we have the greatest message, the greatest news that could ever be told and spread. Why aren't you more interested in that? And every year, the number one or number two top answer to this is, I'm not interested in church because hypocrisy among religious people and religious leaders. And those of us who are part of it go, "Eh, yeah, I kind of get that. And we understand. And, and it even makes sense why they're not more interested because if we are here saying things like, oh, if you follow Jesus, it'll change your life and it'll change how you do relationships, it'll change your character and all of these things. And yet they look at our life and they see that it only kind of works or it only kind of changes things or it only works when we're here on a Sunday morning or with our Christian friends. It's kind of like advertising as a personal trainer to people who aren't in shape or strong. And they're just not interested. And I think that that's something that that should cause us to pause and go, man, how do we change that? 
How do we be people who change that paradigm, who change the, 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 the situation from one where hypocrisy is so rampant among our churches to saying now, like, we're going to live authentically. We're going to fight against hypocrisy. We're going to be people who genuinely and consistently follow Jesus, and it changes the world around us because of it. And we do that by living like Jesus at all times. We're going to look at Galatians chapter 2 and see how this played out. Because this isn't an American thing. This isn't a recent thing of just in the last 10 or 15 years or more. This actually goes back to the beginning as, as the early church tried to figure out what's it mean to follow Jesus? How do we navigate this? How do we do this well? And they were making some of these mistakes along the way as well. So Galatians 2 starting verse 11 says this. Paul says, but when Cephas, uh, another name for Peter, but when Cephas came to Antioch, I opposed him to his face because he stood condemned. For before certain men came from James, he was eating with the Gentiles. But when they came, he drew back and separated himself, fearing the circumcision party. And the rest of the Jews acted hypocritically along with him, so that even Barnabas was led astray by their hypocrisy. But when I saw that their conduct was not in step with the truth of the gospel, I said to Cephas before them all, if you, though a Jew, live like a Gentile and not like a Jew, how can you force the Gentiles to live like Jews? We're going to come back and read uh, the, the last part of the chapter in just a moment. But right off the top, as we look at this, we see the danger of hypocrisy. Because Peter and Paul are at odds here. There's conflict, there's tension, there's disagreement here, all because of the hypocrisy that Paul witnessed Peter living in. And, and, and before we get into that, I, I just want to take a quick aside that hey, this isn't Paul just slandering and gossiping about Peter in Scripture form. That would be very problematic for us. And, and I think it's important as, as we live in a day and age that, that loves to talk about people's problems but not talk to them about them, that loves to slander and gossip and post things in orchids and onions groups and all that and one-star business reviews without talking to the owner. That's not what's going on here. Because as, as he said, he said, I opposed Peter to his face, or Cephas is the, the, the name he's using here. I opposed him to his face. I went to him directly and had a conversation with him about this. And what we have here in Scripture isn't Paul slandering him, but instead saying, hey, you guys may have even heard about this conflict. It may have been a big deal. They may have heard about this. He's saying, hey, here's what happened. But more than that, he's using this as a teaching opportunity. Here's what we need to learn from this, how we can be better at following God. And so what was the problem? Because we get the shorthand account of what happened and Peter is having some, some meals, he's eating with the Gentiles, and then these people come for, with James and he stops eating. Why is that a big deal? Well, it actually is a, a pretty significant deal that we need to, to back up and look at some history to understand why this was so problematic, why it garnered a rebuke among the disciples here. So uh, backing up from that is the early church was established after Jesus' death and resurrection. He says, go and, and make disciples of all nations, and they are, are seeking to build a church that does that. They're, they're also wrestling with who does this apply to? Because for all of their existence, all of human existence, basically at that point, God had dealt with a specific group of people, the Israelites, or what would later be called the Jewish people. And so there is an initial thought that the gospel of Jesus, the good news that Jesus came to save sinners, um, applied just to those Jewish people. And, and so God had a much bigger plan, which all of us who are not from Jewish descent can all say amen and be thankful for. Um, God had a much bigger plan that he had to lead his people to understand, no, 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 this is for anyone who is willing to call Jesus their Lord and Savior. And so in Acts chapter 10, we see that God begins the process of leading them to this understanding. And so God uses this guy named Cornelius, who is a Gentile. He's a non-Jewish person. He's, uh, he's a centurion, so he's a military leader. And God gives him a vision, a very clear instruction to go find this guy named Peter. There's instructions of where to find him. Go and send a messenger. Here's the town. Here's who he's staying with very specific, more specific than we have bad dreams after last night's pizza. Like this was very specific. So he's like, okay, I'm gonna do this. Uh, he sends people down at the same time, Peter has a vision about food. Some of you are more interested now because there's food. And, and, it's, and there's this blanket that's laid out of all kinds of unclean, non-kosher foods. Now he doesn't say what kind of food, 
And I'm like, okay, I'll just use my imagination to fill that in. So they can't have pork, so I'm imagining bacon and baby back ribs, and uh, I really like pork tacos, so I'm imagining some pork tacos on there. They can't have meat and cheese mixed together, so there's probably some cheeseburgers and some pepperoni pizza on this blanket all the good stuff, right? Some of you are lobster fans, I'm not, but like some of that stuff, the non-kosher, it's all there. And in this vision, it's all laid out before Peter and God tells Peter, rise and eat. Have at it, he says. And Peter opposes, no, no, God, like, I would never eat that. I have never eaten that, it's not clean for me. God says, hey, what I have called clean now, don't call unclean. God's reiterating what he had already communicated to his people. There is a new covenant. The old covenant was about ceremonial laws and clean and unclean. It was about food laws and all the ceremonial washings. That's the old covenant. The new covenant is about you and Jesus, he's saying. He's like, so, so don't start operating in the old covenant. Operate in the new covenant and agreement in Jesus. While Peter's having that vision, these messengers from Cornelius come. They communicate why they're there. Peter understands this is from God. He, they go up to Cornelius' house. They start talking, and Peter sees God's at work. This guy is not a Jew. He is not someone who would I would expect to follow Jesus and kind of feel weird about even having an opportunity to share the gospel with him, but he does. He and his household all receive Jesus. Peter spends time with them. He baptizes. He eats with them. He dines with them, and then Peter's got to go back to the church in Jerusalem because he's got to give an account for what just happened. But also, Peter now understands he's got the, the imperative to go communicate that the gospel is for anyone. And so he, Peter leads them through this, and in Acts chapter 11, uh, he, he's recounting what happens. Is he's, he's making this argument that says, hey, the, the message of Jesus isn't just for Jews. And he says this as he's describing, he says, I began to speak, the Holy Spirit fell on them just as on us in the beginning. And I remembered the word of the Lord, how he said, John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. If then God gave the same gift to them as he gave to us when we believed in the Lord Jesus Christ, who was I that I could stand in God's way? When they heard these things, they fell silent and they glorified God saying, then to the Gentiles also, God has granted repentance that leads to life. Now, here's, here's why this matters, because sometime later, Paul tells us that Peter is back with some Gentiles. So, Peter, the one who led the early church to say, hey, those old religious rules aren't valid anymore. We just have to worry about Jesus and following his instructions. Those old religious rules that said we couldn't eat with Gentiles or that Gentiles were some kind of second-class citizens, all those things are now null and void. There's a new agreement of following God that's just in Christ. The same Peter that says we have freedom and all of these things is dining with the Gentiles and then some fundamental religious leaders come up from Jerusalem and Peter steps back and doesn't want to associate with these people anymore. And, and we're told that these people that came uh, up from Jerusalem are, are uh, from the, what he calls the circumcision party, which is later known as the Judaizers. These are people that said, well, maybe Gentiles can follow Jesus, but they have to become Jews first and go through all of the things that are required to be a Jew and then follow Jesus on top of them. And Peter is more worried about making them happy than about continuing the message of Jesus. And so he, he steps away from these people. We're not told what happens here, but I'm sure that they didn't appreciate being ostracized and being treated as second-class citizens. And we're told in just a few short verses by Paul the ripple effect of damage that happened. How, how Peter's actions led other Jews who were there with him to start also acting hypocritically and, and start acting, as, as Paul says, not in step with the gospel. You're not acting consistent with who Jesus was and what he called us to do. More than that, Peter's actions of hypocrisy even hindered some people's walk with Jesus. There's a guy that's mentioned here, Barnabas, and, and Paul says he, he led Barnabas astray for a season. Now, Barnabas may not be a household name like Paul and Peter and James and John and some of these other big guys, but he really should be because Barnabas had a really significant role in the New Testament church. He was incredibly influential. He was someone who, who had a, a very formative influence. He's the one, after all, who, who vouched for Paul's conversion who said, hey, 
Paul is, is not the guy killing Christians anymore. Jesus has changed him. We need to listen to him. He's the one who accompanied Paul in his first missionary journey, probably helping Paul figure out what it meant to do ministry and to, to represent Jesus. Uh, later, Barnabas would, would go on to disciple this guy named John Mark, and it was kind of a controversy because even Paul didn't think he was fit for ministry, but John Mark would go on to write the Gospel of Mark, a pretty big deal in our New Testament. So Barnabas is, this, is a pretty significant person and, and would have a lasting impact, but Peter's actions here almost ruined that because he said that Peter's hypocrisy led him astray. And see, it's really easy for us to just look at this and, and point fingers and say, oh yeah, those people are terrible, look at them. But haven't we done the same thing? Haven't we proclaimed with our mouth frequently that we follow Jesus and yet our actions communicate something very different? Haven't we been people who have ostracized and, and pushed people away because we've been more worried about looking good in the eyes of religious people? Haven't we been people who act one way around our church friends or our religious friends and act a very different way when we're around a different group of people? And, and so the danger of hypocrisy isn't just some historical thing that we have here, but it's something that's within each of us. That we need to say, how do we, how do we break this cycle? How do we be people who live consistently for Jesus at all times? and accurately re reflect and represent who he is instead of giving mixed messages to the world around us. Because when we act in hypocrisy like Peter was here, there's a ripple effect in our world as well. Like I'm sure happened with these Gentiles that Peter ostracized, we, when we are, are hypocritical on our actions, we leave a ripple effect of pain and hurt in relationships. Because when we're hypocrites, it's not usually about doctrine or teaching and will you have an inconsistent you know, theological viewpoint on this. It's us being inconsistent with how we represent Jesus and how we live that out and usually with how we treat people. Because often when we're hypocrites, we're people who say, yeah, God is loving and gracious. He's full of love and compassion for people while we are, are hateful and angry and unprepared forgiving and judgmental in our attitudes. And so usually the result of our hypocrisy is this wake of people that we've left behind that get a taste of Jesus from people that are rude and selfish and judgmental instead of seeing Jesus in our actions. But more than that, when people see our hypocrisy, they start to question if Jesus is actually powerful at all. Because we say, oh yeah, I believe in Jesus and he can change anyone and he can fully transform lives, but then they look at our life and it only seems to be transformed when we're in a building or around a group of people that also believe. And the rest of the time, we're someone completely different. And it makes it look like Jesus can't actually do anything after all. So how do we, how do we shift this? How do we live as people who operate consistent in our faith who have real and genuine beliefs. And I think we do that not by working on our actions, not by focusing on more tasks and more stuff to do, but by starting by remembering the important power of faith in our life. We'll get back at uh, Galatians 2, what, what Paul says. He says, we ourselves are Jews by birth and not Gentile sinners. He's like, hey, this us versus them thing that was going on here, we're on the inside of that. He says, yet we know that a person's not justified by works of the law, but through faith in Jesus Christ. Like, hey, this background of this religious stuff, all these rules, the religious law that we follow, the ceremonial laws, it's like they didn't do anything. They didn't justify us. They didn't give us salvation the way that we think they did. But he says, we have um, faith in Jesus Christ. So we believed in Christ Jesus in order to be justified by faith in Christ, not works of the law, because by works of the law, no one will be justified. Verse 17, but if in our endeavor to be justified in Christ, we too were found to be sinners, is Christ then a servant of sin? Certainly not. If I rebuild what I tore down, I prove myself to be a transgressor. For through the law, I died to the law so that I might live to God. And he says this in verse 20, I've been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. In the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. 
I do not nullify the grace of God, for if righteousness were through the law, then Christ died for no purpose. He says, hey, we have to go back to understanding how we got here. And by here, he means how do we get to the place of understanding that God loves us, that God forgives us, that God wants a relationship with us, that we are, as he says, justified before God. And the way that we do that isn't through following the laws. For us, it's not by being a good moral person and looking good on the outside. It's not by being a good upstanding citizen and being a good moral leader. It's only by faith in Jesus Christ. If we ever mix those two up, our only option is to end up in hypocrisy. Because if we think we are forgiven, we are saved because of what we do, then we're just gonna double down even more on that. We're gonna try harder to put on a facade and, and wear a mask that says we are perfect and we don't do anything wrong. And it's a house of cards that we can never keep going. And eventually people are gonna see the sinful self on the inside. But if we lean into a relationship with Jesus and we say this is the only way that I have grace, that I have forgiveness, then we can get to a point like Paul of being rooted in that relationship and make a statement like he says, where he says, I've been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. In the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. So we're gonna use that verse to talk about what it means to be people who are living authentically. Not people who are living perfectly, because we can't do that. Not people who are flawless and and have attained some level of, of superiority, but just people who are real. Because even as we fail and make mistakes and sin, if we do that well in our authenticity, we can point people to Jesus even in our flaws. So how do we do that? And I think as we look at Galatians 2 today, we see four things that we can do, four mindsets that we can adopt that can help us live authentically. And the first is that we need to fully surrender to Jesus' work. Paul says, I've been crucified with Christ. It's no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. For for Paul, he's communicating that he so radically surrendered to the work of Jesus in his life that he is a new person, that the old person is dead, that the old Paul that people may have gone to high school with and knew in college and all that stuff, he's gone. He doesn't exist anymore. Paul is also the the person who penned the words in 2 Corinthians 5, 17, where he says, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. Behold, the, the old has passed away and the new has come. And so for Paul, he says, hey, I have so fully surrendered to Jesus' work that it's made a new person. I'm a version two of who I used to be. And I wonder if, if, if that is where we go astray sometimes, that we go, hey, I'm gonna skip over kind of remembering that Jesus is the one that does this and just jump to, well, I wanna live authentically, so I need to read the Bible more, I need to pray this much, or I need to read these devotions, or I need to do this, and we skip to the tasks, instead of just remembering that we've gotta remember to just sit at the feet of Jesus and say, I'm surrendering my life to your work in me. I'm surrendering to who you want me to be, and I'm putting my old life behind and finding new life in you, which gets us to our second point, and that is that we have to embrace our new identity in Jesus. Paul says, I'm not the same person. He goes on, he says, I've been crucified with Christ. It's no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. It's no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. Paul's saying, my life isn't about my priorities, my agenda, my wants, my goals, my desires. It's about what God wants for me. And I wonder if that's what's leading us to the place of hypocrisy sometimes because we're saying with our mouth, Jesus is our Lord, Jesus is the one I'm living for, but yet our actions communicate that we're living for our own motives, our own goals, our own desires, our own success, our own fame, And we're actually living lives that's trying to bring glory and honor to us instead of glory and honor to Jesus. Because Paul's saying we have to have our identity rooted in Jesus and rooted in the fact that we're living for him and that that that's correlated to us surrendering to Jesus, that our old life has, has reached a conclusion. Our old life of pursuing what we want has reached a conclusion and we're now living for Jesus and him alone. 
So what are you living for? What is, what is your identity rooted in? Is it rooted in the material things around you, your career, your, your success, your family, your, 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 your possessions? Is it rooted in those things? Or is your identity rooted in being a follower of Jesus and saying, hey, I exist to live for God and what he has for me? Because if we want to live authentically, we have to embrace the identity of Christ follower in our life. But also, I think as we look at this passage, we see that if we want to live authentically, it also requires us inviting community and accountability into our life. You know, this isn't necessarily in his, his statement here in verse 20, but really the situation as a whole, we see that the reason that, that Peter was aware of his hypocrisy, the reason that he was able to shift gears, the reason that this didn't snowball into a much bigger problem is because someone held him accountable. That someone being Paul went to him and said, your actions are not in step with the gospel. You are out of line in what you're doing. And we see how helpful that was, and yet we are people who frequently want to live in isolation. We want to separate ourselves from anyone who's gonna tell us we're doing something wrong. We want to be people who don't have to hear that we've done something wrong. But yet scripture continually talks on the importance of this. I wanna read four verses to you on this. Uh, Proverbs 27, 17 says, iron sharpens iron and so one man sharpens another. We need people speaking into our life to help us get better. Later in Galatians chapter six, Paul writes these words, if anyone is caught in any transgression, you who are spiritual should restore him in a spirit of gentleness. That, that we should go and help people get back to the place of following Jesus well. Jesus says this in, in Luke 17, three. He says, pay attention to yourselves. If your brother sins, rebuke him. If he repents, forgive him. We have to remember to do both, not just the first one. Proverbs 15, 32 talks to how we receive these interactions. And it says, whoever ignores instruction despises himself, but he who listens to rebuke gains intelligence. The Bible is very clear, the power of community and accountability and this is just one of the many reasons we love life groups here at Calvary because we believe that if you get yourself into a community of people seeking to follow Jesus together, you're gonna make each other better. Iron sharpens iron, you're gonna get better. You're gonna encourage and exhort one another. But you're gonna occasionally have to tell each other where you're out of line. And so let me ask you, in general, are you living your life in a way that is open and available for people to correct you biblically? to tell you that you're out of line, to tell you that you're not in step with the gospel? Or have you built up walls saying, I know better than everyone else and no one can correct me? Because we need community and accountability. Finally, if we want to live an authentic life for Jesus, I think that we need to remember to find rest in God's grace. Paul ends verse 20 with a statement. He says, the life I now live in the flesh I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. That's not just a, a theological statement from Paul here, but as he's referencing living the life in the flesh, elsewhere when he talks on this, that's not a good thing. Him referencing the flesh is like all the nasty, sinful tendencies that he has within him and that we all have within us. That's the part of us that knows what we're supposed to be, but be doing, but we just don't want to do it. That's the part of us that we're fighting against going, man, I, it, it's, it's my old tendencies to sin and rebel against God that's tugging at me. And he says the life that he's living in the flesh, he says he lives by faith in the Son of God. He said, who loved me and gave himself for me. As, as Paul was talking about how do we, how do we live this how do we walk this road of, of living authentically when we're going to fail and mess up? He says we do that by remembering the grace of God that is available for us. He writes these words uh, later in Ephesians chapter two, just a few pages later. He says this, he says, for grace you have been saved through faith. This is not your own doing, it is a gift of God, not a result of works so that no one may boast. We didn't earn salvation. We didn't earn grace and forgiveness from God. It was given to us as a gift, which means that we can't earn more of it. 
We can't make our life look better and try harder and do more to earn more of God's grace. Because if we are in Christ, if we believe that Jesus is the Son of God and Savior of the world and we have made a commitment to follow him with our life, we have freely received all of the grace and love that he has for us. And our Heavenly Father isn't this, this parent who's only pleased with us when we hit the home run and get the good grades and do a good job. He is infinitely and completely satisfied and pleased with us just for being his child. And conversely, when we mess up, when we do what we've been talking about this morning and live hypocritically, when we treat people poorly, when we rebel against his plan for our life, that doesn't subtract from his love for us. It doesn't mean that he is pleased with us or that he wants us to sin or that there's not consequence. It just means that his love for us is not dependent on our performance. And I wonder if in the midst of this, we just need to remember that we don't have to labor and strive to make God happy with us because if we're in Christ, he already is. We don't have to labor and strive to, to look better or more spiritual or more religious than we already are and end up in that place of hypocrisy. We just need to trust in the work of Jesus who can infinitely and perfectly do that work in us far better than we can attempt our own. And see, as we do this, as we pursue Jesus, as we place our identity in him, as we trust in his grace, our life begins to transform as we pursue this life of authentic faith, that the inside of us begins to transform as we experience his joy, his contentment, his perfect peace, and his purpose in our life. And so our life begins to transform. And not only that, the world around us does as well. As they get to see a version of Jesus on our face, as we are people who are transformed and changed, and more accurately reflect Jesus by living authentically with him day after day. And we get to remember that living for Jesus requires us living like Jesus at all times. So today, that's our hope for you, that you would live genuine faith each and every day, not just when you're here, not just when, when it's, the problem is before you, but every single day striving to live for Jesus and trust in his work and grace in your life. As you do that, we believe that your life will transform and that the world around you will as well as they see Jesus in you. Let's pray together. God, we thank you that there is grace available to us because as we are here reflecting on this topic, we are here reflecting on all the ways that we have messed up. God, not a single one of us, myself included, is immune from, from this tension of living contrary to the life that you've called us to live, of living hypocritically, living inconsistently, living inauthentically to the message of the gospel. And so we thank you that there is grace available that we can rest in, that we can find hope in, that we can be encouraged in. But God, we don't want to stay in that place either. We want to, to grow to be more obedient to you, more faithful and more authentic in how we're living. So help us to do that. Help us as we leave from this place with all the ambitions and desires we feel in this moment to carry them into tomorrow and the day after and the day after that. Because God, we want to experience the life you have for us. but We also want to be better messengers of the incredible good news of Jesus to the world around us. And we know that the best that way that we can do that is by living for you and living like you at all times. So God, help us as we do that in Jesus' name. Amen. The four steps to living authentically, Robert laid out, are first, fully surrender to Jesus' work. Second, embrace the new identity in Jesus. Third, invite community and accountability. And finally, find rest in God's grace. If today's message stirred up something in your heart and you'd like to talk about it with one of our pastors, I invite you to email us at questions at calvaryaz.com. Well, that's all for today. I hope you have a fantastic week. Please come back and join us again next weekend. Bye-bye.